speaking to some of the highlights of the last quarter and our year so far. After his remarks, we will be open for questions. Mike, please go ahead. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks uh, everybody uh, who's on the line. So we are pleased to announce a very strong Q2 2020 with significant free cash flow generation. Uh, a few of the highlights, uh, Q2 uh, cash flow was 225 million on EP capital spending of 95.6 million. So we delivered uh, strong uh, free cash flow of 121.3 million or 45 cents per diluted share. Q2 production averaged uh, 299,400 BOEs a day, which was uh, pretty much at the top end of the guidance range of between 295 and 300,000 BOEs per day, and up 7% over Q2 2019 production. Uh, we had uh, strong uh, Q2 2020 cash cost performance, and that was highlighted by our OPEX of 306 a BOE which is down a full 12% uh, from the corresponding quarter in 2019. Um, starting with the, the production update, um, second quarter volumes of 299,400 BOEs a day uh, do include the impact of the company's natural gas storage injections during the quarter, which uh, reduced quarterly production by approximately 4,000 BOEs a day. And these volumes are planned to be sold during the fourth quarter of this year uh, into a higher gas price environment. Uh, a similar Q3 2020 production range of 295 to 300,000 BOEs a day is currently anticipated. Um, and these estimates do include the impact of significant scheduled maintenance uh, on both uh, TransCanada and uh, Enbridge systems uh, and our corresponding plant turnarounds that we time to those outages. We'll also continue in July with uh, storage injections in California and uh, like everyone else, we had a bit of a late start to Q3 field operations as it was extremely wet uh, in BC and Northern Alberta during the first half of July. Uh, we expect fourth quarter production to be uh, very strong uh, at between 320 and 325,000 BUEs per day um, as the full uh, quarter production impact of the approximately 42 wells will bring on stream during this quarter, Q3 will be realized, as well as a further uh, 57 wells which will be tied in uh, during Q4. Uh, and again, those fourth quarter results will also be positively impacted by our storage withdrawals uh, from California and Dawn. Uh, so we're now um, expecting an increased 2020 production exit of between 322,500 BUEs a day and 327,500 BUEs uh, per day. Uh, current 21 production estimates, uh, uh, as outlined in our five-year plan of approximately 320,000 BUEs per day, will be revised in conjunction with the release of our uh, 2021 capital program, uh, and we'll do that with our Q3 uh, results in, in early November. So our ongoing 2020 uh, M&A business and our ongoing uh, robust second half 20 EP program uh, are currently expected uh, to increase uh, 2021 production and ca cash flow uh, from the previous outlook. Uh, a few financial uh, highlights. Uh, as mentioned, uh, second quarter cash flow was $225.2 million. Uh, which was essentially flat um, to Q2 2019 of 226 million, despite obviously very challenging oil and liquid prices uh, that we all endured during the second quarter of this year. Uh, first half uh, 2020 cash flow, uh, approximately 509 million or $1.88 per diluted share. Um, we're now expecting uh, on strip pricing uh, full year cash flow of uh, 1.05 billion, and we're maintaining our $800 million maintenance capital budget. Uh, Q2 earnings uh, were 20.1 million, and that does underscore the low cost profitable nature of our EP businesses across all three complexes. And as mentioned, Q2 OPEX was a highlight, uh, down 12% year over year at 306 of BOE. Um, briefly on our capital programs, uh, first half uh, EP capital spending this year was basically right on the, 
the full year maintenance capital budget of, of 800. So we spent 401.8 million. So as mentioned, exactly half. Uh, Q2 EP spending was 95.6 million, and that was significantly lower than our cash flow of 225 million, uh, yielding a very strong free cash flow generation. And that free cash flow was utilized to fully fund the dividend, to acquire Chinook Energy, uh, to fund deep basin acquisitions, and to also reduce debt, all during one of the most difficult quarters uh, in the history of our industry. Uh, net debt at June 30th, uh, 1.69 billion, that's down 148 million uh, from March 31, 2020, uh, after accounting for the funds received um, with the Topaz Energy financing, which was uh, completed during the quarter. Uh, in the current five-year plan, net debt to cash flow trends down to less than one times by exit 21. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we plan to maintain our leverage in that range one to one and a half times. And the excess free cash flow will be allocated towards dividend increases, uh, um, share buybacks, and debt reduction. Uh, on the acquisition front, uh, during the second quarter, we did complete the acquisition of Chinook Energy for $24.5 million, including the assumption of their net debt. That added production of 3,500 BOEs per day. Uh, and we also acquired 2P uh, book reserves of 35.6 million BOEs. Uh, we have subsequently reduced Chinook's processing costs by approximately uh, 45% since that acquisition. And we've uh, fully incorporated Chinook's assets into our long-term BC Montany growth plan. We also completed several small transactions in the Alberta Deep Basin during uh, the first seven months of 2020 for a total cash consideration of 38.3 million. These, acquis these acquisitions added an aggregate 3,200 BOEs per day of production, 32 million BOEs of book 2P reserve, uh, 67 sections of land, a gas plant interest, uh, and a very extensive tier one uh, drilling inventory. These high net back assets are all in close proximity to our existing infrastructure and uh, they will be accretive on a consolidated free cash flow basis in 21 based on current strip pricing. And we plan to continue our deep basin consolidation efforts as well as our, our BC Montany efforts and we expect further opportunities for uh, Topaz as a result of these in 2021. Uh, which will further improve already strong operating and financial metrics. Uh, for these acquisitions. Uh, and of note, our interconnected deep basin asset, uh, where we're the largest producer, uh, it is currently Alberta's largest gas field, and our goal is to uh, make it a lot larger. Uh, looking at a couple of uh, marketing updates, um, we are Canada's largest natural gas producer, uh, with forecast total average 20 gas production of 1.5 BCF per day. Uh, and we have 530 million per day transported and sold at six NYMEX price hubs uh, on firm long-term transportation uh, contracts. Uh, currently, Termaline has an average of 351 million per day hedged for the second half of this year at a weighted average fixed price of 237 per MCF Canadian. Uh, we also have an average of 156 million per day of, of NYMEX basis done and we move approximately 400 million per day of incremental volume that's exposed to the export markets, and those include Don, Chicago, Ventura, Sumas, Malin, and PG&E. Um, natural gas fundamentals for 2021 are steadily improving, uh, and of note, approximately 75% of Termaline's natural gas volumes are sold on the western half of the continent, uh, where the gas uh, supply diminishment is anticipated to be the greatest. Um, and that includes um, the hubs at PG&E, Malin, Sumas, Station 2, and Akel. Uh, a bit of a brief EP update. Um, the company remains on track to deliver the best capital efficiencies in our corporate history uh, and, you know, at or near the top uh, on a North American large cap basis. Um, as mentioned, uh, with the full uh, rig fleet of 10 rigs going now, that's still within our 2020 maintenance capital budget of, of $800 million. 
Uh, the second half EP program will drill approximately 79 new wells and complete approximately 99 wells, and that includes 24 ducts that were not completed with the first half 2020 program. And as mentioned, uh, we expect 42 new wells will be brought on stream in Q3 and a further 57 wells during the fourth quarter. And of course, that's going to yield uh, very strong Q4 production and, uh, as mentioned, the increased 2020 uh, production exit. We continue to seek opportunities to improve all aspects of our execution and to continue uh, to reduce cost in all aspects of our business. Uh, ongoing company optimized technology developments have reduced uh, our aggregate drill complete costs by between 5 and 10 percent over the past 12 months. Uh, and those highlights include continuously improving frack designs, our water management initiatives and in business, uh, our monobore drilling efforts, and a broader application of rotary steerable technology in all three core complexes. Uh, we are pleased to report that uh, the company received $3.2 million in funding from ERA, which is Emissions Reduction Alberta, in support of our expanding diesel replacement initiatives uh, through our new technology development. Uh, and again, that's across all three core operating complexes. Um, we as a company continue to make significant measurable reductions in our emissions. Um, Termaline has the lowest net emissions in the Canadian senior category, and we have defined hard reduction targets for net emissions going forward, including methane, and also reducing our emission intensity over the next five years. Um, the Canadian energy sector uh, invests over half of the funds invested by all sectors of the Canadian economy in environmental performance improvement on an annual basis, and that total is going up. And we believe that Canada produces the net cleanest methane molecule in the world, and the Canadian natural gas sector is only going to get better going forward. And so that's the end of the formal remarks, and uh, Brian and I and Jamie are here to answer any questions that you might have. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile a Q&A roster. And our first question comes from the line of Patrick O'Rourke from ATV Capital. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, you guys have obviously done a very excellent job on both the capital and operating cost side here. I'm just wondering where we sit sort of in that cycle. Um, and if there is any low-hanging fruit or, or potential uh, for further improvements. And then maybe conversely, uh, and I know it feels like we're a long way off from inflation in, in the sector and specifically oil services, um, but just wondering if, if there is to be kind of cost vulnerabilities that emerge, where, where would the first place that we should be looking for those be? Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Patrick, uh, for the questions. Um, I mean, we continue, as I mentioned, to look at reducing costs throughout the business. Uh, and, and I know you're aware that, you know, over the last six and a half years, we've brought our drill complete costs down by a full 50%. Um, <clears throat> they're not going down another 50%, but we always have, you know, between eight and ten uh, new technology avenues that uh, we're pursuing on the capital cost side. Uh, to further reduce costs, and, you know, you've seen it even in the last 12 months, we're down another 10%. Um, I'd say most are small, uh, but then in aggregate, uh, they can turn into something meaningful. So if, you know, perhaps over the next two years, we can find another, say, 10%, you know, on a plus or minus billion per annum uh, D&C budget, uh, that's a, a significant amount of capital reduction that you know, in part is translated into to free cash flow. Um, I mean, operating costs are down, uh, service costs are down. Um, those are perhaps more transitory if you do get into that uh, inflationary uh, environment. But, you know, I'd say fully 80% of the cost reductions we've achieved to date over the last six and a half years are, are because of our efforts uh, and they're not going away. Um, in Brian's five-year plan, um, he actually, you know, other than this year, builds in two and a half percent inflation um, into that plan. And so, you know, we do 
uh, acknowledge that uh, inflation may creep back in. Uh, and if that's because of higher commodity prices, uh, bring it on. Yeah, I think we'd all like that. Um, just yeah. a, a quick a, a quick follow-up question, and you guys touched on the balance sheet there, the target range between one and one and a half times, and I thought that the uh, the new five-year plan slide that's in the deck is, is excellent, but that would bring you, um, you know, well below that range, um, talking about, you know, potential for dividend increases, share buybacks, and then, uh, also acquiring resource uh, potentially through acquisition with that free cash flow. Just wondering if, if when you look at those three, is there one where there's uh, a preference for allocating capital? Uh, I'd say uh, debt reduction and um, uh, finding the time, the right time to do dividend increases would be the top two priorities. The acquisition capital primarily we've try to, um, you know, allocate that um, from our Topaz equity uh, and, and fund our M&A business that way and uh, keep the organic growth five-year plan intact. But clearly, you know, if you get to that position five years out where your debt to cash flow is, you know, um, 0.5, uh, there is some inherent acquisition capital built into the uh, the structure of the company at that point. Brian, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good, Mike. The only thing is structurally commodity prices continue to improve and we've seen some good tailwinds there. Over time, we might take a bit of that free cash flow and expand our profit program and, and move our growth rate up a little bit as well, just organically. But we have to see strong tenure and sustainable improvement in the, in the gas prices before we even consider that. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Faye Lee from Audlem Brown. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Bye here. Uh, just regarding the 2020 CapEx budget, or the maintenance budget of $800 million, should we consider that being fairly firm given uh, for the remainder of the year? Uh, well, it is at this point, yeah. And uh, I think we've been pretty good at, um, you know, having good cost discipline. We've been you know what, 402 million in the first half. So we're in a bit of a, not completely unique, but uh, a lot of our EMP brethren um, don't have as much capital to spend uh, in the second half of, of this year. Uh, and so we essentially have half of our maintenance capital budget uh, to utilize, which is what is generating the strong uh, production momentum in, in Q4 through to exit, really sets us up nicely in, in 2021. So, I mean, if gas prices, uh, if there's a remarkable improvement in, in gas prices, as Brian mentioned, you know, we can look uh, at the 21 and 22 budget and, and what we should do with that. Okay, so that'll be in the um, upcoming years rather than this year if you, you see that improvement. Yeah, we've got the program uh, pretty much dialed in right now. Okay, and can you talk a little bit about the market for acquisition in, in this current environment, like how you you see in and um, the willingness of parties to to divest in this in this market well it's it's more robust than it's been in the past and it's less expensive than it's been in the past from a, a generality standpoint I mean I think you see the transactions that we've closed on you know it's 10,000 a flowing DOE or less uh, and you're buying uh, 2p reserves for well I mean you're you're buying PDP reserves for less than their value. Uh, so, I mean, that's partly why we created Topaz in the first place in fourth quarter last year was we saw what we recognized as a generational opportunity to perhaps participate in that business. But I would point out that, you know, we transact on well less than 10% of what uh, uh, we evaluate. Um, and so it's not necessarily always easy to get deals done. Okay. And um, I noticed in the five-year plan that the April price assumption kind of um, comes off a bit in the out years. I'm just wondering about the thinking around that. So, sorry, the what comes off? April price. Oh, the April price. So, in 2020 and in, in 2021, it continues to contangle. And then you're right, in 2022, it backwardates a bit. That's just the strip itself, so Cy. So, we're not okay. interpolating our own assessment of what we think gas fundamentals are, we're just plucking the strip out and laying it in there. 
That's all that is. Okay, and you so see that, a similar pattern in uh, the NYMEX structure as well, I think. Okay, all right, got it. And just the last question, uh, COVID-19, um, in terms of the, um, didn't seem to have much of an impact on your cost structure. Do you see that kind of being the case going forward or just how that, um, what impact COVID-19 has had on the operating cost structure? Um, I, well, I'd say it's you know, had none uh, on the, the actual cost side. We've got our full staff contingent uh, back in the office and started bringing them back in a safe and methodical way. Uh, started that over six weeks ago. Our field operations continued during Q2 um, and in our drilling completions and facilities work. Um, thus far, we've had uh, no positive tests of anybody that's uh, working in the field. So, you know, so far, so good on that front. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. Great. Bye. Thanks. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, that's star one on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Jordan McNiven from Tudor Pickering Holdings. Your line is open. Hey guys, I got a couple of questions for you here, which uh, may actually um, tie together. The first one, just on the five-year plan, you know, relatively low growth on a percent basis, but you know, as the largest gas producer, you know, reasonably significant volumes uh, overall. Um, you know, when you look at that, like, what are your thoughts on kind of growing the basin as a whole? Um, like, do you see your your growth mostly backfilling other declines? Do you see it generating absolute growth? And just kind of, what are your, are your thoughts on on you know? growth within the base and, and, and in a broader macro perspective? Sure. Um, the five-year plan is, is really the organic growth piece. Uh, and so it's, you know, four to five percent per annum. Um, and a lot of it's actually on the liquid side. Uh, and so, you know, we have um, decreased our growth rates uh, over time, um, as mostly because the commodity price wasn't rewarding it. We're quite uh, constructive on the supply demand rebalancing that's been occurring um, in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. And I'd suggest that it's probably a bit further along than it is south of the border simply because we've had lower prices for, for longer. Uh, and so we do not want to grow basin supply in, in any significant way uh, right now because we want that supply demand um, uh, rebalancing uh, to continue. and and hopefully translate through to um, strong impact on pricing and gets rid of that backwardation that uh, Ryan was just uh, alluding to. Um, so, um, you know, the first part of your uh, question is really our approach, keep basin supply plus or minus the same uh, and grow our proportion of that supply through our uh, M&A activity. Got it. Okay. Thanks. And then, um, maybe this is related, but um, on the LNG side, you know, that being probably, you know, the larger growth market from a longer term perspective, um, when you look at potential opportunities there um, and you think about the different mechanisms uh, through which you could get involved, um, I'm just curious what your thoughts would be on, you know, something like what EOG and Apache have done, um, where they've taken on a long term, you know, liquefaction commitment, um, but have exposure to, you know, the global prices or, you know, other producers which have gone more of just a strict supply agreement um, and therefore don't have the, you know, the liquefaction liability on the balance sheet, but also don't have the global pricing exposure. Just curious as to how you guys think about that and what might be the ideal structure for you guys balancing the you know, pricing upside versus, you know, the, the liability um, on a long-term commitment. Um, well, we're certainly looking at, at all of those opportunities and it is, uh, a logical uh, extension to our really seven-year um, gas marketing and transportation diversification plan. I'd say, um, you know, we prefer supply deals uh, over the full exposure to the, the liquefaction uh, at this point, but, um, you know, we're going to continue to pursue that over the next uh, couple of years, and, and hopefully something comes to fruition in that time frame. Brian, anything? Um, I think that's good. I mean, we see other ways of just getting, if it's just that deal that's indexed to ACO or to NYMEX, we're able to do that already. So we're looking for a method where we can get a little bit of exposure to the Asian market without having to make a full 
commitment to the, the equity piece that you mentioned on the on liquefying the, the hydrocarbon flow. It's kind of a hybrid, I think. Yeah, more to follow. <laughs> okay, that's it for me. Thanks, Thank guys. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Gordon. Our next question comes from the line of Jim Miller, private investor. Your line is open. Hello, uh, thanks for taking this call. Um, I was just going through the five-year plan and it doesn't look like there are any facilities in the plan, but I know that you have talked about some deep cut, uh, either expanding at Dundee or at the new properties that you acquired. Could you talk some about how the facilities will fit in with this plan? Yeah, um, the facilities dollars are included uh, for every year in the five-year plan. That is every dollar of capital that the com company will expend. So it's drill complete, facilities, pipelines, everything uh, is in there, including capitalized uh, G&A uh, in that five-year plan. So it's in there. Uh, over time, the proportion of the annual capital budget that's been dedicated to uh, facilities and pipelines has dropped as um, you know, we have largely completed the construction of our infrastructure skeleton across all three core areas. So we're sort of down. Historically, we'd run north of 30% of the annual CapEx uh, was infrastructure related, and now we're sort of down in that 10 to 15% range. So it's in there. So every dollar we spend is captured in that plan. Okay. Because I, I thought those were fairly expensive plans, the deep cut you know, the, the large deep cut plans. Are those- Yeah, it is. On the, on the... It's 150 okay. million Gundy phase two, and it's incorporated in the plan, and the dollars are in 2021 okay. and 2022. Um, so 150 in aggregate, and we'll pay some of it in 21, and the balance in, in 2022. Okay. And it, it's the only significant uh, facility project in the whole five-year plan, but, you know, we will point out that there are a number of very viable projects that aren't in the plan um, uh, simply because we're moderating our growth and keeping it in that sort of four to five percent per annum range. Great, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you. It, it clarifies everything. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further questions in queue. I'll turn back to the presenters for closing remarks. Thank you very much for uh, joining us on this call today and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect. Do you want to listen to another on-call conference? Press 1 for yes or 2 for no. Press 1 for yes or 2 for no. Press 1 for yes or 2 for no. Goodbye.